know, the more you dig into it, the more you research it, you realize like it, like the moment is now, like we yeah. have, you know, under 10 years to make significant progress. Um, and, you know, I think when you look at all of those, how, why wouldn't you go into uh, climate and um, you know, there's both challenges as well as huge opportunities. Welcome to Climate Papa. This is a show about climate change, technology, and parenthood. Welcome to episode 14 of Climate Papa a show about the intersection of climate change, parenthood, and technology. And I'm Ben Idelson. I'm an investor based in Seattle, and I'm a papa to a five-and-a-half-year-old girl and a two-and-a-half-year-old boy. Investing in climate tech is a funny thing. As we've covered here before, climate change is such a broad problem with a need for so many solutions in different parts of our world. So what exactly does it mean to invest in climate tech? Is that the same as clean tech or green tech that we might have heard of in the last couple decades? Today, I have David Rusenko on to dive into the world of climate tech investing and his approach to it. We cover David's journey. He founded Weebly in 2007, entering the fourth batch of YC and going on to literally give the talk on how to find product market fit. He joined up with Square and grew Weebly to hundreds of millions in revenue. He went on to lead Square's e-commerce business and left last year in 2022. When David popped his head out to think about what was next, he came to a familiar conclusion, that he would deeply regret not spending this essential decade working on climate. This conversation was filled with an abundance of agreement on the urgency to work on climate, the importance of founder company fit, and the values that we want to bring to our work with founders. We talk about some of the areas most interesting to us and the underrated role that Y Combinator, known as YC, has played in bolstering the climate tech ecosystem. As I've gotten to know David over the last few months, I've consistently found a kindred spirit, someone trying to take the last 15 years of product and company building and apply it to climate tech in a way that really empathizes with the founder journey. Well, here's David. I'm David Rosenko, and I'm the managing partner at Leap Forward Ventures. I have two boys who are seven and four years old, and I'm based in San Francisco. Are you all managing September illness season? Yeah, our kids started a little bit later than most, so we haven't gotten um, that like dreaded first cough um, when you just know your life's ruined for like the next two to three weeks. But um, but our oldest did have his tonsils out last week, so we've been finishing that recovery, uh, and that's been he's doing great. So that's, that's been good. Is he like allowed unlimited ice cream quota? Or- you you've literally never seen a kid more excited to go into surgery at the hospital at like six in the morning. He just knew it was like popsicles, ice cream, like all kinds of whatever it takes to feel better. So he was pretty jazzed actually going into the hospital. He's, I guess that's like the one surgery that has a lot of good, a good, <laughs> a, a fantastic reputation. Maybe before we jump into all the climate things you're doing and thinking about, I think it'd be useful and inspirational, frankly, to a, to a lot of people to hear kind of your, your pre-climate path and then how that kind of connected over. Um, because I think you're one of kind of a cohort that I've seen of more traditional tech product, maybe some kind of fintech product, fintech adjacent product to like now, you know, an expert in climate startups. Sure. I actually, I grew up overseas. I was born in France. Uh, my parents were teachers. They're both American, but we lived in France when I was seven and moved to Morocco um, and lived there for 11 years. So I moved back to the U.S. for the first time uh, to go to college. And uh, that's where I met both of my co-founders. And moved out, I think we were the fourth batch, uh, Y Combinator batch, moved out in January of 2007. Um, Literally did the whole pack all your belongings in a car, uh, drive cross country, got stuck in the snow in Wyoming for two days, um, but then finally made it. And my background originally, actually funny enough, started off in electrical engineering before moving into software. So that never been relevant before, but it's relevant now. And um, started a company called Weebly. Um, you know, just, just to kind of, um, cut that story short, we, we grew the company over basically over the next 16 years from zero to 350 employees, um, you know, to hundreds of millions of dollars of revenue, uh, sold it to square in 2018. We, I ran global e-commerce at square for a few years before um, handing over the reins uh, to my number two and, um, uh, and leaving 
in uh, la last summer uh, around April of 2022. Uh, so then I would say the first half of my career. And we believe, um, and we believe primarily was what? How would you describe it for those? That you know, we started we started off as you know in 2007 we started off it was just really hard for anyone to make a website. So we started off simple, mostly with small businesses making websites uh, as people's needs evolved. So did the product, and eventually. It was primarily e-commerce and we primarily enabled people to set up online stores and sell online. And so that's how things evolved over the years. Got it. And I mean, YC, you know, fourth batch of YC, how did it even get on your radar and how did you choose to do it? Um, because I don't think it's, I don't think most people knew or had ever heard of YC at certainly in 2007. I've been following Paul Graham. I think that's how a lot of people in the beginning learned about YC. I remember I read about it. It was late at night. I was reading Slashdot, which is also a blast from the past. And the story on Slashdot was application deadline is tonight for Y Combinator. And so in my brain, I had heard about YC. And so I decided to apply in two hours um, to meet the deadline. It was midnight Pacific, 3 a.m. Eastern. So um, so I did that without even talking to my co-founders and then, and then called them up the next morning and asked if they'd be interested. And luckily, both of them were. But yeah, I mean, at the time we did YC, we were the winner of seven batch. Uh, it was 12 companies, I believe. And we each had, you know, I think we each had 15 minutes to present at Demo Day. Uh, so things were definitely different. <laughs> what is it? It's one minute now? It's one minute now. But like at the time, 15 minutes, that was crazy. You know, like, how could you possibly only you know, have 15 minutes? Oh, man, different times. Okay. So you gave us the square story. You said you left oh, a year and a few months ago. How did, how did you go from Square and e-commerce websites to climate and why? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, and I think everyone has a climate story and, and how they decide, you know, some people have been at it for a really long time. Uh, some people are brand new and do it. Um, I was the type of person that, you know, I think a lot of people are like, I saw the stories and I just didn't click on them because they were too depressing. And I just didn't, I didn't have the emotional, mental, whatever bandwidth um, to even think about it. And so I just segmented it away and didn't really pay a ton of attention to it. And I, I think honestly, it was probably around the time uh, that we had our first kid and things, things change. You're definitely a lot more invested in the future in a very different way. And it was close to around the same time that, that we sold the company. And so I think that opened up a little bit of mental bandwidth for me. And it was shocking what I found out once I actually started researching and learning. I think the number one shocking thing to me was honestly how much I'm not going to say all of it is figured out, but a lot of it is more of an implementation game than a technology yep. invention, you know, needing new technology game. And, you know, the more I dug into it, the more there was actually an interesting and positive story there uh, about how things could evolve. And yeah, it was totally fascinating going deeper. And it really played into a lot of my interest, but also, um, you know, skills that I had in terms of engineering, in terms of electrical engineering and be able to understand a lot of what was required for us to transition the economy. I think it's often pitched, it's often seen, I'll say from the outside, it's a very depressing story. And certainly there are pretty depressing things about it, but I think there's also really an optimistic view of what things can be. And, no, and then the last thing I'll say about it is that you know, the more you dig into it, the more you research it, you realize it like the moment is now, like we yeah. have Oh, under 10 years to make significant progress. And, you know, I think when you look at all of those, how, why wouldn't you go into uh, climate and, um, you know, there, there's, you know, there's both challenges as well as huge opportunities. All, everything you said resonates. I kind of went from, can I handle this article about famine in the middle East for, as a result of climate to like, okay, I'm engaging to like, okay, how do you unpack what could be done and can we do it? And what are the barriers? And then you start undoing those layers and you're like, I have no excuse not to fully engage on this, right? If you're able to. And, and to that point about the, the time is now, like this, it feels to me like this decade is going to be, and we're going to look back and be like, that was, that was kind of the decade that a bunch of things tipped over. That'll be the decade that all these, all these climate impacts tipped over. And we really started feeling those. I mean, the summer was an example of some of that. And it's the decade that we started to really properly, like, implement some of the things we needed to do and start to see, I don't know, 2023 from 2033 should look pretty different in terms of the, the world. And I, you know, some of those things are pretty already happening. Maybe you look at EV adoption and you're like, it'll be pretty, I feel pretty confident saying in 2033, we'll look around and like, you'll see mostly EVs on the road for passenger cars. 
Now, the other things are, I think, the things that, that you and I are like, how do we make this happen? It, it's the decade we need to make it happen. Gas furnaces to heat pumps or you know, the right curve of solar adoption. And so um, it is a very exciting time to be in it. Yeah, and I think that there's so many challenges. Um, it, it, for the most part, a lot of them aren't necessarily technology these days, but it's just, you know, it's hard to get a lot of different people moving in a different direction. But taking that cargo ship, you know, it takes time for it to turn. It takes time, you know, to change things. But I don't think, I think about, you know, I'm in my late thirties and, and our oldest is seven. So, you know, it's about 30 years until he's my age. And I don't think about anyone. I don't think anyone in 30 years is going to really care for our excuses. No, um, you all. know, there, you know, I, I think he's going to look back at my age and be like, well, hold on a second. You guys knew exactly what was going to happen and you didn't do anything. That's right. And like, how could you possibly explain that? How could you possibly explain that we knew what had to be done? And in fact, it wasn't even that crazy expensive to do it. And no one had to suffer any quality of life effectively. Mostly, you know, mostly upgrade. Most of these things are going to be upgrades in our life. Most of them, it's like, exactly. hey, just like you just do it faster. Just get to the better thing faster. <laughs> but due to you know, just the realities of things moving slow and we just didn't get around to it fast enough. And now we're at the stage where it's either going to be like their life's worse or it's like much, much worse. And humans are resilient, adapt, but I think it's going to be real tough to explain if, you know, if life looks really different in 30 or 40 years, why we didn't do anything faster. Yeah. And so you took, that's like, you can have this broad energy and knowledge and way of approaching a problem. How did you land on, I guess we didn't get into it yet, like what you're actually doing, you know, does it start another company? Cause you've done that. Is it build another team instead of like, there's lots of different potential tools to go at this, go back to school and learn something new? Like, like how did you go, go through the kind of what you should do and where did you land on that? Yeah, I spent, um, I started getting educated, um, because to me, learning, starting to learn about it was the most important. And, you know, I think everyone, you know, I think people's journeys oftentimes are somewhat similar. Um, I started going deep in trash and recycling and that's just like approachable and interesting in the beginning. There's a lot of interesting things to learn there. But didn't really want to do a full survey and really understand the broad landscape. And when I did that and I was still working at Square, you know, it became apparent that uh, that basically there was there was a lot that needed to be done on the political and the policy front. And so I spent the first few years working on that in my personal capacity. And we kind of forget looking at the way things are now. But but a year ago, you know, it's called like January 22 to January 23. Like the picture was looking completely different. Yep. And and you know, it seemed like we might not get anything significant done on climate in the U.S. and elsewhere. And um, we go from that, that was a world where, where I was really applying as much of my efforts as possible to help change that. And, you know, luckily we made a lot of progress. And now there's this feeling of, you know, not just for people in climate, you know, I think people um, outside, there's this feeling of, hey, we're observing the impacts in our daily lives so in the summer and otherwise. And by the way, a lot of these te technologies are just way better. These, I think a lot of people have had experience with solar maybe on their roofs or maybe driving an EV and they realize that these are really cool technologies. And so there's this feeling of m more a feeling of inevitability to the transition. And so now I think it was just about how fast we can move, yeah. but that wasn't the case a year ago. And so yeah. that's in, in that context, that was where I was really applying effort was to try to change that. And, you know, once that changed and then naturally transitioning out of my role at Square, uh, I wasn't sure whether I was going to make a full-time job, have a full-time career in climate and exactly what that would look like. But the transitioning out of Square was the perfect opportunity to go uh, join full-time. I had this uh, issue for a long time as someone who's like started a couple of companies or built products. It's like your first thing is like, what's the, the hammer I would reach for? It'd be like, what product should I build here? Um, and is, do you have that same disease? I mean, I looked at all the opportunity, you know, everything that I could do. I thought about starting a company. In the end, I decided to start a seed fund um, a firm called Leap Forward Venture, where really my thought process there was there, every company will go through different challenges as they, um, as they try to find product market fit and engineering and such. But the company building side is shockingly similar across companies. And yep. what, what your struggles and your challenges are when your team is 15 people, and then when you hit 25, and then when you hit 70, and then when you hit 125, and you know, when you hit 250, you know, the, the, these are all pretty similar challenges that companies face as they scale up. And um, having gone through that experience myself, 
uh, I felt like one really important way that I could, you know, to this whole wave of entrepreneurs that are getting started is just to help them navigate some of those challenges and help them be more efficient about growing their companies um, and scaling their companies and help them maximize their own impact. And so I'd had a, a decade of experience uh, in investing as an angel and, you know, decided um, that, uh, that that was the right path going forward. It's interesting to think about the like scale and leverage you get on your learnings as opposed to just like applying that in one specific one specific company, one specific idea, um, particularly in this story of like trying to move an ecosystem forward, right? Trying to move like a set of companies forward around a set of problems. Yeah, I think, yeah, I mean, there's a lot of ways to think about it. The thing that motivates me the most is just trying to help founders because it, having been through it, I have so much empathy for how hard it is. And I jokingly say that um, that doing a startup is like long form torture. Um, because yeah. it, it's, it's both the best experience and the hardest experience that, that you'll ever go through. It's just so incredibly challenging. And, and I think sometimes it's really hard to see that perspective from the other side, from people writing the check, from people who are investors. And so one of the things that, that really motivates me is how I could be the type of investor that, that, you know, some, and I've had these role models as an entrepreneur on some of the most amazing investors and, and, and how, you know, there's just not that many, there's not that many that that really understand what it's like and are really amazing partners and and so really that's that's really what what motivates me is just I'm working with founders and trying to be able to help them in in whatever way I can um I like to say our best investors were there when we needed them and they weren't when we didn't yep and uh, I think a lot of times founders really underestimate how much even an average investor can be a net detractor um to the company. It's, that's kind of what gets me out of bed in the morning is just being able to support founders in whatever way I can and also understand that uh, you know, I'm not playing a leading role. I'm not taking front seat here. This is their thing and I'm here to support them however I can. Or, or if there's nothing to do right now, then I'm not bugging them and creating more work for them. Yeah. That, that is, a, it is, as you said, like surprisingly unique once you get into it and you've been on both sides of it that um, I think the industry has evolved, but it's still the case probably, I don't know, be good to do an analysis on this before I overspeak, but it's like most investors potentially have never built and shipped a product and most have not built a company. And is that necessary to be a great investor? Certainly not, right? There are a lot of counterpoints to a lot of great investors that are effective. But if you think about what founders get to do now, I think in building out a team of investors, right? Like there's different skill sets and a want on your team. And I think wanting that partner or a good chunk of the partners to be like empathetic to the journey because not just because they've seen it 200 times, but because they've lived it one of those times or a couple of those times, I think can make such a human difference. And back to parenting, it's like, it is quite different to talk to someone who is a parent than someone who has been around a lot of kids and knows a lot of parents. Like, like the visceral, 100%. the visceral, oh man, you're, are you in the newborn phase? Oh, like. Just how terrible was last night? Like, let's just unpack the schedule. Let's talk about feeding. Like, how'd you guys do the, like, like that feeling you just, it, it is a lived experience feeling. Totally. And so I'm with you there. And that one of the things that just gives me the most energy is when you can sit with a founder in those equivalent, raw, hard, vulnerable places, and help them get through the next night, you know? Yeah. And I think, I think there's so much room to the answer is obviously not always going to be yes. And I wish it was, but yeah. can, can I be truly respectful of you and your time and what you're doing and, and tell you if it's a no and not ghost you and, um, oh, and not say like, oh, I'm in as, you know, as soon as you find a lead and to not make my decision primarily based on what other investors are interested in, but based on my own convictions and then just make quick decisions and follow up quickly and hopefully provide interesting and useful feedback. And, you know, I think it's just, you know, it's just the little thing, not being 10 minutes late to a meeting. I have all these stories as an entrepreneur. I remember one, one firm we pitched, we got brought in for lunch and they didn't look up from their sandwich and their phones, like the entire pitch. I'm like, why are we even here? Yeah. Like, is there some kind of meeting quota that you have to fill that it's so just odd. rude? It's yeah. just rude. Like what, like, it's just, what are you even doing? Yeah. So I think you learn from those experiences. You feel them viscerally as an entrepreneur and then, and then you try to do, um, you know, be respectful, um, uh, on the other side and to the extent that you can help out in a variety of ways, try, try your best to do that. Like actual conversational presence and like active listening and engagement is 
the whole va- is the thing. I don't know. I don't like, yeah. like, like that is like, okay, my brain is connected to yours while we have this conversation and we work through this stuff, whether that's, you know, your stress around fundraising or the product or the climate impact or whatever it is. And if you're not doing that, like what, like why are you, yeah, like why are you in the same, I don't know. I just think that's like where it all happens. I mean, in any relationship, but like particularly in one where you're trying to like mind meld with someone a little bit, like, yep. yeah, let's, let's turn back to to climate and the overlay of this, like what, so climate tech investing has now become a sector of sort. Like it encompasses, seems like everything from new battery technologies and grid scale batteries to new electric vehicle companies, to new things out of the lab for methane and carbon removal to, you know, software, carbon accounting products. My theory is that all of it's important. We should do all of it. There should be people engaged in doing all of it. But I'm also think about where like I'm most useful and helpful and kind of find the right bounds. How do you think about that? Especially coming from, you know, similar, like a software product fintech background. Yeah, I agree with you. The way I kind of lay it out and I wrote, um, I wrote up a landscape on my blog, which sounded like an old school thing to say, but, but if you go to david.blog, you find that and yeah. And basically separating the way about the broad climate tech landscape is separating out into energy and energy transition stuff, which is just absolutely massive. Um, you know, I think more hard tech or science required, you know, which, which basically what's interesting about a lot of these areas is they're just the hard to decarbonize stuff. Um, you know, oftentimes you need both some kind of scientific breakthrough as well as these markets that with carbon removal, for example, are still also nascent, right? So there's yeah. extra challenges there, but, but I also think a lot of opportunity and that, um, you know, I think there's green fintech, which is sort of emerging a lot of people thinking through. And I think that's really interesting as well. And then going through adaptation and then accounting and offset. So that's broadly speaking, the five categories in terms of how I break it up in my own mind. But for me personally, like I said, just given my engineering background, a lot of the energy stuff is front and center for sure. Uh, transportation, buildings, um, you know, a lot of grid technology, uh, battery stuff, you know, so, so there's a whole ton of things under there. Uh, that's really, you know, what I like to be sort of the center bullseye and then, um, but still very interested. I mean, you, you know, we could talk a long time about, uh, you know, about potential for e-fuels, for example, or a lot of other things that I think are super promising and hopefully just on the horizon. Yeah. Part of this is almost just like this time. I, I almost think of it as like this time scale thing, right? If you look out the next, I don't know, you know maybe look at the next 20 to 30 years, like different things are at different stages of deployment. And so meaning at different points in time, we should be doing different things with them. Like, we should all be buying our, you know, the next car we buy if we need a car is an EV and we should be like, like that should happen now, basically, you know, in the next two to three years. But like, you know, e-fuels kind of what are the things we need to do to have the right industry, you know, it's, I'm, I'm guessing over the next like two decades, right? And CDR, yeah, we're trying to stand up at the certain pace. Obviously, it'd be great if all those things were pulled forward, but they're at a different, like a different development pace or a different scale. The way that they scale up is different. And so it's interesting to think about like, how the different time horizons of these things might hit. I don't know if that's a yeah. framework that you think about as well. No, totally. Because especially I think about time horizons, investing in climate tech now, there's a lot of conversation about how is this or is it different than clean tech? And a lot of investors and a lot of LPs got pretty burned by that experience. And I think of it also from a time horizon perspective. I think I personally see so many analogies with the dot-com boom and then how Web 2.0 came back when we were moving out back out to the Bay Area in 2007. And I think it's funny because the, the conversation around 2005, 2006, 2007 timeframe was, man, those were some really stupid ideas. And, and there were some stupid ideas, don't get me wrong. And there was yeah. a huge mania. Um, so it turns out actually that a lot of the ideas were pretty reasonable. It just, it was just a decade too early. Yep. I mean, and we're, we're adoption up. wasn't there. It just, it took 10 years. You know, unfortunately people, or fortunately, you know, depending on how you see it, people out at the leading edge, at the forefront, right? See things before they happen. They get really excited about this future trend that's just become apparent and maybe a little bit too excited for how early things are. And, and so I see a lot of analogies, again, with clean tech being that way. Not, not everything obviously panned out, um, you know, but I think we now are at the point where technology is advanced. The, um, you know, new Lazard's LCOE report, you know, for the first time last year shows that new build Renewables like, uh, you know, like wind and solar are now cheaper to operate than the marginal cost of natural gas, of operating a fully depreciated wow. natural gas by yeah. absolutely staggering. And then the trend for solar, it just continues to plummet. 
Yep. So, you know, if you pull that trend out 10 or 20 years, you know, the implications of that are pretty staggering, actually. And those are the kind of really big shifts that, um, you know, it's, you know, policy is great and policy is helping and policy levers that we're seeing are massive, but those underlying trends are the ones that are, that, that are, are going to power the shift going forward. Yeah, it's a really interesting analogy to think about with the internet. With the internet timing, it was almost, I think the fundamental cap was like, was somewhat physical. Like how many people are connected with the right devices to have this be like a viable, good business based on like your kind of install base, right? And then mobile did a whole nother bigger version of that, right? And say, we well, thought you were riding this like internet desktop computer wave or, or laptop wave. Now this is actually the curve you're on if you're yeah. building any interesting, you know, new business. And yeah, what it'd be interesting to unpack. I mean, I haven't, I haven't like done it with exactly that framework. Like, what are the things that are the physical equivalents that it, like underlie now versus then? I think one is the cost, as you said, of say solar um, and other renewables. Those are somewhat like, um, I mean, those will have ripple down consumer impact. But I also think about just like the quality of devices, right? Like EVs were just not mm -hmm. interesting, viable mm -hmm. products like at the scale a decade, 15, 20 years ago. And so like, now they are which then has a bunch of ripple effects on EV charging, then there's like an industry we need to figure out and a problem space we need to go and pack. Um, the way we heat and cool our homes and buildings, like that technology has come a long way in different climates. So now you have this kind of growing coverage map, I think of you know, for heat pumps that maybe that you wouldn't have been able to reach, you know, 15 years ago with the, the state of the art then. Yep. What are the other ones that like play into, okay, the underlying kind of, I guess like market trend that you would say this is different than the last cycle. Certainly batteries, um, yep. you know, are another huge one. Um, you know, and battery technology is continues to advance and lower in cost. And that's enabling a lot of very different use cases. Certainly as you start to look at self-consumption or more local consumption of renewable energy, um, I think that's interesting. Obviously looking at transportation and EVs, um, uh, you know, possibly um, on the horizon, uh, aviation, you know, starting with short haul and, but even, even just get di diving into a specific looking at you know, the F-150 Lightning that has so much battery capacity, they can now power your job site um, without needing to bring a generator along. And so I think, I think sometimes these are these fundamental building blocks that seem really simple and that have these like massive ripple effects the same way that mobile you know, and having a camera and a GPS in every pocket, you know, enabled something like Uber or Lyft. And so I think yeah. we're going to see a lot of those type of shifts as these new technologies come and just form the underlying assumptions about how the way the yeah. world should work. Yeah. Batteries are probably like, I guess when put that way, like batteries almost feel like the mobile equivalent. It's like the idea that you're going to have energy store, large amounts of energy storage, both with you on the go, usually tied to your transportation and inside your home in a different way, right? Like we just had the, an episode with, with Channing Street Copper, which is an induction stove company with a built-in you know, battery. But that's a concept that you wouldn't have really conceived of 10 years ago and like all the benefits and trade-offs of that. And I think you're going to see that in more and more home appliances or, you know, the, the battery at the home. I don't think we've quite conceptualized what that will mean for the next 20 to 50 years. Like, I don't know. Yeah, I mean, I think there's a ton of implications that, you know, that, that may not play out until, you know, they look obvious, you know, with the benefit of hindsight. I think around, around buildings specifically, I think it's likely that we're going to transition to more of a focus on self-consumption and... Could you define, I think, self-consumption? Yeah, I mean, there's a few things that play when you talk about, um, when you talk about battery, you know, kind of, kind of what's, um, uh, you know, what's incentivizing battery installation, potentially as more and more energy is generated locally. One, one of the reasons for that being a benefit is just transmission distribution have been incredibly difficult to scale up. It can be very cost effective, um, the cheaper that solar gets to generate in your house. And then it comes with ancil ancillary benefits like resiliency. Uh, so when the power goes out, which is something that we're seeing um, happening more and more often in California due to fires. But I think, you know, the more that, that sort of natural disasters start to trend up, the more you'll see resiliency being a primary concern for people. And by the way, resiliency is a fancy word for it, but it's pretty cool to be off grid and not rely on anyone else for, you know, for your fundamental needs. That's you know, like that self-sufficient is, is a feeling that a lot of people can, can really, you know, resonates with a lot of people. So there's certainly the resiliency piece and storing the energy that you generate and using it for a power outage is one thing. Um, and whether that's a battery, like a, a whole home battery, or whether that's an EV, you know, certainly adding that into the home. But you know, the other thing we're starting to see is that, um, 
uh, the duck curve keeps getting steeper and steeper, meaning as more renewables and as more solar is being added to the grid, you know, all of a sudden there's these peak solar times that, um, that, that just sometimes even in California, we're starting to have an overcapacity um, of energy during uh, peak solar times. And so um, there, there's been this big move to start to shift tariffs over to time of use rates, how you're charged for your energy being more an hourly thing, but also um, uh, in California specifically with net metering 3.0, that is a new policy where you get asymmetrical compensation, meaning you're not paid, uh, you're paid for the generation, not the full amount that, that you paid for the energy, for the, for the cost of electricity, which includes both the cost to generate it, as well as the cost to transmit and distribute it to you. I think a lot of people are up in arms over that change, but there's really nothing new. Uh, if you look at Australia, that's that's been the case for a while. You know, anywhere we, where you sort of get this this saturation of solar, eventually, it's very logical to switch to that. The what idea that? being just to unpack that because, like, the idea being that, like, hey, you have to build the transmission infrastructure anyway, so it's like economically what you're able to offset by generating your own power is not generating power somewhere else. So, like, we have to eventually have those. Like, you have to eventually equalize the economics to what you're saving on the other side. That's the idea. If you're taking the energy or you're giving it back, you're still using the transmission right. and distribution infrastructure. Right. And like the net metering plan basically says, look, if you pay 30 cents kilowatt hour for electricity, all costs included, which about a quarter to a third of that is, you know, only a quarter to a third of that's the cost of generating it. The vast majority of that's the cost of transmitting it. You know, the original net metering said basically you just get a one to one offset. So if you pay 30 cents, we give you 30 cents. And the new regime says, uh, no, no, we're only going to give you back the cost of generating it just like any other generator on the grid. Um, you get yeah. paid the same as anyone else that's generating that electricity. You know, the downside is that slashes the cost that you get back by two thirds of 75%. So it's a pretty significant reduction in your compensation. What that does, though, is that incentivizes people to try to keep as much of that energy locally as possible and then use it themselves, which is the self-consumption portion. Got it. Because storing it and off and not using uh, grid energy at night, you know, um, exactly. like is, is a better economic use than trying to send it back to the grid during the day. Got it. Okay. So when you look at all of this, I mean, you're meeting with a bunch of founders all the time, presumably looking at different areas. You're thinking about these different areas. Like... One thing I think that's fun to do is stoke people's uh, creative brain to think about things that might be gaps. Like I still think that there's a lot of companies missing that need to be started. Are there areas that you think people should should kind of go down, especially if they've thought, oh, like I don't know anything about climate, I don't know how to jump in, like that you that you're most excited about? I know that you collaborated on the on the YC request for startups, so we'll link to that. But like you know, to kind of click a level deeper, or that was also a year ago. So things have changed. Yeah. I mean, I'd say like the most comprehensive answer is still the YC request for the climate tech request for startups. Um, there is a lot in there. And even though it was written a year ago, it's, it's still just as relevant today. So I think that actually is a really great place to start. Um, gives you an overview of sort of, you know, a broad overview of climate tech and then lots of different, I mean, each area has maybe a dozen ideas yeah. of, of things you can tackle. So um, yeah, I mean, it's just, it's just been fascinating watching, watching the space evolve, even just in home electrification or building electrification in the last year. Um, it's just interesting. There's a lot of companies that are sort of starting to build out a value chain and starting to specialize, which I think is really fascinating. And so, you know, there's companies that are specializing in incentives and rebates. There's companies that are specializing in home energy modeling. There's companies that are specializing in, um, in, in helping contractors and that supply side, but even within that, there's specialization in terms of, um, you know, in terms of the project design and helping contractors do a better job or, or really a quicker and better job at, um, at designing a system for a home. Um, uh, there's, there's quite kind of a sales and marketing layer for contractors. All these companies are effectively working with each other yeah. and starting to fill in the gaps and starting to plug in. And so it's just really been, you know, I think, pretty fascinating watching that whole ecosystem evolve. And, and you know, I think that's going to be the ecosystem that five or 10 years from now, you know, these are all going to be very big companies that kind of have each carved out their own area of expertise and they work with and rely on each other for that. Yeah, I agree. And I think that it's like you think about the market of this and you're like, well, how is there so much there? And you're like, well, just in the U.S., there's 85 million something like that, right? Single family homes. That doesn't include a bunch of other, you know, all the other buildings we can talk about that need to be upgraded. 
And upgrading a home is not a couple hundred dollars, right? Like they were talking about, I don't know, probably somewhere between twenty and two hundred thousand dollars of spend to upgrade the kind of four or five big decisions around a home, right? Your source of energy, your heating, cooling, your hot water, your dryer, your stove. And those are all big purchases, right? And 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 so the software marketplace contractor install, like these are all big layers to that. And all of it, to our, to our point earlier, like kind of needs to happen over the next decade and is ready to go. I mean, those are all areas also where we generally have you know, or will soon have the devices we need. So it's really this like deployment problem, which I think lends itself particularly well to like software marketplaces, fintech, where it's like, hey, we just need to go faster, right? And so I think there's still so much there. Yeah, I mean, these are huge markets and, and you know, uh, heat pumps alone, residential heat pumps are $40 billion a year. Yep. And that's, that's a market with a very regular replacement cycle. That's not just a point in time climate transition thing. And that technology is advancing quickly and, you know, is, you know, legitimately better and, and, and way more efficient and cost effective than the alternative. So, um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's kind of easy to forget, but these are absolutely huge markets that are going through massive change. And, you know, one of the things that, that one of the things that excites me, frankly, about climate tech as an entrepreneur is, you know, I think whenever you see a large market going through rapid change, that's very exciting for, for entrepreneurs, um, because that means there's opportunities to make things better. Um, and you're, you're getting some, some of the biggest markets in the world that are, that are transforming faster than we've ever seen them transform before. There's going to be big opportunities to, to change the world in positive ways. Yeah. And so if someone feels that and they're like, okay, how do I get started? Because there can be the sense of overwhelm. Um, there can be the sense of, oh, there's so many different things to learn about. And I know carbon removal is exciting, but then you're talking about residential electrification. And these are such different problems. This is one of the reasons I wrote that that guide as one entry point. But like, what do you, what is your what is your general guidance when you talk to someone who's maybe not yet like a founder with a pitch or even an idea, but it's kind of earlier, right? It's someone reaching out to you from Square and they're like, okay, I want to follow your footsteps and go into climate. Where would you steer them? I think the most important thing is just understanding what your natural interests and talents are and and skill sets and 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 making sure that that aligns with what you want to pursue. So I think, you know, it's not a bad thing for someone with a software background to go into carbon removal, for example. But, it, you know, if you're looking at that kind of business, I think the things that some of the natural talents and skill sets you would really need are, um, you know, really being able to be a fantastic storyteller and fundraiser. And if you're going to go into a capital intensive business, you better feel confident that you have the skills to raise a lot of capital. Right. Um, you know, another example would just be um, if you're gonna if you're gonna create software um, and sell it to uh, real estate holding companies that manage large portfolios, um, that's an enterprise sale type of company. Um, what does enterprise sales fundamentally mean? I mean, the, the CEO is the chief salesperson, and you got to get out of bed in the morning getting super excited about yep. sales. And is that the kind of company that that you feel like you are energized to build? Um, and so I think you know it's really just about introspecting a little bit and understanding. What are you interested in? What are you good at? What do you know? And then kind of starting there and pursue your interest until you find, you know, this area that's an opportunity. There's just so many opportunities right now. There's a lot of people getting into it. And I think that's awesome. And there's so many more places that need more people. And so, you know, as long as you understand yourself and what you're interested in, what you're good at, then you can survey the landscape and figure out where you want to you know, orient yourself. I think that's one of the other differences from a decade ago, or I guess 15 years ago when we looked at uh, the clean tech wave, is I think it's a different there's a different set of people. There's like a different marketplace for talent than there was. Like, and I remember that wave a little bit, but it wasn't filled with like people leaving Google to start a battery company. Like, and I think now there's so much appetite for, I mean, there's all the kind of preconditions that we talked about with the market, but also I think there's a lot of appetite to, to go and kind of find all the nooks and crannies where software and is part of the problem. People want to work on this stuff, right? People, you know, including us, like we want, to work on the problem that is, is we don't want to have regret for not working on 30 years from now. I think the only competition for that, which I'm curious to get your perspective on, is the excitement and rightfully so on the wave of AI tools and LLMs and all the stuff going on there. I find a lot of talented people kind of torn between 
hey, is this like once in a lifetime moment to go work on, you know, the the frontier of LLMs or is this the most important calling to go work on something climate related? And I'm curious if that's something you also have in your world and what your framework is for thinking about that and for yourself. I mean, you could you could have raised a, a fund or, or your fund could be, hey, we do climate and LLMs. How do you think about this? Yeah, I think, look, I think there's always any given time, there's lots of interesting things you could be working on. Um, you know, I, I also do see sort of AI and climate as sort of the two waves of the future. And the difference to me is, um, you know, I've been out, I wasn't out in the Bay Area for the dot-com wave. I'm very jealous that I couldn't be out here for that. But, um, but, but I was for pretty much every wave since then. And when we moved out here in 2007, um, it, it was such a fun feeling because yeah. people were here for the right reasons. There was naysayers. People were saying that there's still some of that, some of that dot com hangover going on. There, there weren't the tourists. There weren't people doing it because it was fashionable, because it was the cool thing to do. It was just people doing it because they thought it was awesome and they were just naturally excited by it. And usually they were engineers or they were people who knew the technology and they were just in it out of pure passion. And so I think if that's you for climate, then this is the best time to be doing that because I think climate tech right now reminds me exactly like what it felt like to be out here in 2007. It's the people doing it for the right reasons because they're passionate about it. They obviously see the opportunity. They see the transformation and the impact that they can have. But it's not people doing it because it's like, I mean, you know, there's, maybe there's some, but like most people aren't doing it because it's the fashionable thing to do that that they think is going to make them piles of cash, right? I, I, I don't think that thing is, I don't think that's necessarily true about AI and LLM. So I do think that there's so much opportunity there. It's just very different. It is the fashionable thing. To your point, yep. it is the thing that's pulling everyone in that sees that it's a once in a lifetime opportunity. And I think similar to how, you know, crypto was um, not that long ago, you know, there's obviously going to be very real, important, meaningful crypto companies. There there have been, and there will be more. You go through that mania, that those heightened expectations, there's going to be a coming back down to earth at some point. Um, and, you know, to me, that's just more speculative. That's not necessarily always about building real value, um, you know, over, over a decade and, you know, building a real company. And, you know, they're obviously, like I said, it's not, not to say that there won't be those companies built, but you know, it's, it's more exciting and more interesting to be in the space where everyone's in it because they're passionate about it and not because it's fashionable. Yeah. I think that's right. And I think it, it could be a setup for a bit of a false choice. Like if someone's been really excited to play with the latest tools, there, there are certainly interesting climate challenges that could use that skill set, right? And I don't think that's a fully expanded space. I think there's a lot to be done applying the latest in AI to to climate work. And some companies are already doing this, but there's more to do. And I think your your framework is exactly right. And one of the most refreshing things about working in climate and meeting all the people working on it is it like it is this amazing filter um, of a sort of long termism, right? Like you will see in your lifetime probably like massive impact here. But you're not going to get it in two years, right? Like, right. You're, you, yet you'll get a really tactical feedback loop, right? Like, let's say you're swapping heat pumps out on houses. You'll be like, "Did I do any this month? Did I do ten? Did I do a hundred? Did I do ten thousand? Like, that's a very real, measurable feedback loop. The scale of this is so big that you're gonna, you know, it's gonna be, you know, it'll be a decade before you can can see the measurable kind of pile up of it all. And then, as you said, the markets are so large. That if you're doing something meaningful, there's actually so much economic upside that stares people back in the face. If you once you dive in and unpack it, yeah, you know the idea that we're going to rebuild the car industry, the idea that we're going to rebuild the supply chain for the car industry, the idea that we're going to rebuild the entire energy industry, the entire HVAC industry, the entire transportation of a city. Like these are mass. This is our fundamental infrastructure. We're going to rebuild how we do cement and steel. This is how the world is built and works. And I think it's invisible to a lot of people because it has been steady state and status quo for such a long time that we haven't seen it turn over. And like each of those industries is so impactful, but I think they've become uh, invisible to us until we start kind of like peeling it back. No, I think it's, it is quite different in that way. And it's quite different in the way of, you know, it's not some new invention. It is a problem that we need to invent against. 
Totally. And, ju- and you know, just like you shouldn't go into AI because it's the hot thing to do, you shouldn't go into climate tech because it's the hot thing to do. No. So if you find yourself with, you know, an idea that you can't stop thinking about and an opportunity and you want to start that company, that's the right reason to do it. If you want to get into climate because you just want to get the climate generically, then start looking. But but I've seen founders who smartly opted out and did a different company, not in climate tech, because they, it wasn't that passion thing. They wanted to do it just because it, it was more of that you know, generic uh, category that they wanted to get into. And, yep. you know, whether that's climate or AI, that's, that's probably not the right reason to to start a company. Those 15-year journeys, I haven't been on one like that, but you have, like, there are so many points where, like, you have to dig deep to keep going. And it can't be because you're excited how it sounds at a cocktail party to say you work on it. That's not going to, that's not going to hold you through. <laughs> That's what no one tells you, right? Like it, you'll you'll be at it for 10 to 15 years if everything is going well. <laughs> yes. And still there's so many times you have to talk yourself in to keep going, I'm sure. You know, what stage do you want to talk to people? Do you want to meet founders and, and kind of like, you know, what ends up being your kind of working model for people in terms of like that idea formation to, hey, we have our first customers. You, know, you came through YC, so I'm also curious how you think about YC's role in climate and and kind of like the venture ecosystem around climate and how it all is going to move forward. So from a leap forward perspective, we're usually talking to founders at the pre-seed or seed stages. So usually that's those earliest rounds and, and usually like a 300K check um, and um, really kind of kind of jumping on board and helping to, to build out the round and um, and get the company going. Um, and help navigate to the Series A and what those milestones look like and what that next fundraiser will look like. On on the YC front, I actually think YC has played a little bit of an understated or unspoken but really important role in climate tech. They're, if you go, YC maintains a list of all their portfolio companies. And if you go look at that and you go look in the climate tech category, there's really a huge number of companies that are that are starting to become really meaningful in size that have gone through YC. And... Um, you know, so so YC I think has started to play increasingly more, more and more important role, um, you know, in in climate tech and in seeding some of those companies' ideas, and you know, not just the easy software stuff, but you know, YC's invested in a ton of companies that do more real world, you know, hardware atom based um, businesses. So I think YC is a an amazing platform for companies to get started. I went through it myself. Uh, you know, I think it's funny that that. Uh, that that the biggest evangelists of YC tend to be former YC founders. And let me tell you, we're not getting paid for it. Um, it is truly a great experience that I think um, people can't imagine going without. So um, so I think that when you hear feedback on YC and especially glowing feedback coming from prior founders, that's really telling as well. Yeah, I think it's like somewhat telling that that's like, that that's the user focus. In everything that they do, they think of their user as the founder. And that is such a clarifying, I think, thing that is distinct from, you know, like the historical venture world, which I think typically thought of their user as the, as the LP base or, or someone else. And I think that that, that is such a powerful kind of shift of locus of energy and thought and speaks to then those referrals after the fact. 100%. And so should folks, folks should reach out to you if they are in that phase of, okay, you know, they're ready to raise their pre-seed or seed. And want to get your perspective. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, the website's leapforward.vc and there's an easy way to get in touch and um, even a couple Easter eggs in the source code uh, if anyone can find it. So a um, couple fun things going on there. Awesome. And one last question for you. How do your, how do your kids conceptualize what you do at work and how you think about this stuff? And do they? Oh, that I mean, that's a great one. How, how do you explain um, what you work on? I mean, you know, it's funny... Um, even as CEO Weebly, or then as GM at Square, um, you talk to your kids about what you do, and it's hard to describe. So I just said I work with um, people and computers, um, and that that was sort of the, yeah. the simplest version that I could explain. Um, but you know, it it is funny just seeing seeing the world through their eyes, and you know, one of the funny things is you both see how different the the world is. You see the world in a different way through their perspective, but also you know you 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 have a small part in in shaping that perspective as well. So one of my favorite stories um, is just, uh, you know, our oldest is really in the cars and uh, and we drive a Tesla and he loves how fast it is. And, you know, and, and, and then it sort of dawned on me that, wow, I mean, you know, EVs are just faster, right? So, so in our family, yeah. you know, we'll be driving down the, driving down the highway 
and he'll be like, oh, dad, that car in front of us is going really slow. It's a slow pump. Must be a gas car. Um, <laughs> Amazing. And so it's just funny, you know, it's just funny um, understand, you know, how, how their perspective and the world is just completely different where you speak that big old American muscle car. That was, you know, that was the definition of, of, of fast and, you know, things have just completely changed. Yeah, I, I grew up, my, my dream car was like a BMW M3 type car. And, you know, look at the zero to 60 speed. It was like below five seconds, you know, 4.8 seconds. I think now it's like a little a little family a Volvo SUV and it's like zero to 60 and 3.5 because it's all electric. And it just completely reframes this, this you know, the status. Um, and I think it's such a powerful thing to realize. Cars, for some reason, you know, I mean, status in American cars has been there for a long time, right? And and kind of in transportation in general, right? The motorcycle, the car. It, I think a lot about how do you bring that status to other things, right? How do you think, how do you bring that status to a you know, to an electrified home? How do you bring that status to, you know, a landscaping company that uses electric tools um, that are now, because like it is fast and it's quiet and it's smooth, right? If I think about an EV and that kind of starts to apply and it's healthy, right? That starts to apply to like everything, right? It's like they're, they're usually kind of, better performing, faster at doing the job, quieter, smoother in their operation, right? And the ability to extract power than like a, a gas burning equivalent. How do we create status around all of those other things? Yeah. I mean, it's just, it, it is fascinating how, how things are different. And, you know, part, part of the status may be the status of it being better. Part of it, our kids just aren't really around that many gas appliances or machines anymore. And yeah. You know, when, you know, most of our friends um, drive electric and, you know, in fact, um, you know, a lot of counties now um, in California, something like 40% of new car sales are EVs. And so, um, you know, so, so when they're around a gas car, I mean, to them, it's just like so stinky. Yeah. You know, they're yeah. like, what's that smell? It's yeah. awful, you yeah. know? And, um, and so, you know, I think I'm talking about status. I think that that may play into it as well, which is, you know, we all have these visions, the industrial revolution and like smoke in the skies. And like you see these yeah. paintings of like how awful that was. And I think there's a good chance in 30 years, once we clean everything up, we'll be looking back at the time we're in now as dirty times. Totally. A lot of pollution in the air and things just got a lot cleaner. And the idea that we burned gas in our garage to heat our homes and we burned gas in our kitchen to cook food. It's like, what were we doing? Like, that was nuts. I mean, yeah, we used to paint schools with lead paint, you know? Yeah. And, you know, I think we'll look back on that and, and just everything's going to be loud and gross and oily yeah. and stinky and, and bad for you health wise. Yeah. Well, excited to, excited to keep working with you to, to get to that future faster. So thanks for, thanks for coming on and having the conversation. Well, that's a wrap on episode 14 of Climate Papa. Before we move on, I have a very timely preview of something I've been working on for the last few months. Inspired by folks like David and the work he's been doing, I've been exploring how my role as an angel investor in climate should evolve. This week, I've kicked off my own fund to help partner more deeply with founders. If you're interested in learning more, either as a founder or potential investor in the fund, shoot me an email and I'd be happy to chat and share more details. As always, I can be reached at ben at climatepapa.com. And if you like this episode and think you know others that may enjoy it, I have one main ask please send it to them directly. I care most that these conversations directly reach folks that may find them interesting and impactful for them. Ideally, we get more and more people building, investing, and joining companies that play a role in better climate outcomes. All right, until next time. And here's the Balkan Bump and Lazy Syrup Orchestra remix of Mellow Kind of Hype to take us out. On we go like... (laughs) 